The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Master Mike, good afternoon. Welcome to Man and Light on Manx Radio. Through till one with the constituency MHKs from Ramsey. Alex Allenson and Laurie Hooper are here. It was Monday the 13th of September 2021 that we all, we all sat in the Mitre Hotel in Parliament Street in Ramsey and talked about the upcoming election. Well, both Dr Allenson and Mr Hooper were both re-elected having served a term previous to that. So, Ramsey constituency today, any thoughts? Text, email, call and WhatsApp and uh, faster mic. Uh, good afternoon to uh, Laurie Hooper and Alex Allenson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good, uh, well, it was a long time ago that we sat in the mitre, uh, Laurie Hooper, in that, uh, how long is it now? Time to remember. 2021 it was. We'd just come out of COVID. It was a different world then. Uh, how is Ramsey nowadays? I mean, do you see any, uh, per, uh, do you perceive any change in Ramsey or are you so close to it that it, it, it just happens day by day? It's a difficult one, really, because a lot of the the more uh, local stuff is really dealt with by the commissioners, so it's not something that you're sort of as intimately involved in as an MHK. Uh, But no, I think what we're seeing now is the similar sorts of issues that were raised around the time of the election. Uh, Things haven't haven't moved in some places as much as they could, perhaps. But no, generally, Ramsey's always just been a great place to live, and I don't don't feel that's any different now than it's ever been. And you were a commissioner before, of course. Yes, yeah. You did, um, was it four years? Uh, Four and a half, uh, because I I did a, a bit after the not quite an election in 2016 yeah. um, before the, the general election in, in the September. What's being a commissioner like in Ramsey? Uh, <clears throat> it's interesting. Um, I'll give you that for free. Uh, it, the discussions we used to have around the board table got quite robust, if I remember rightly, Alex. Some of the t- conversations were quite difficult, um, but I, I always felt that the people around that table were there for the right reasons, trying to, to do their bit, really, to help make the town a better place. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's a worthwhile experience, I think, for anyone that wants to try and give something back. Alex Allenson, the future of Ramsey and, and how it's come along? Yeah, I, I'm incredibly optimistic about what Ramsey has always been and what it, what it can be, again, in the, in the future um i mean yes 2021 seems a long time ago and, and obviously from a government perspective you're dealing with one issue after another um but ramsey gets on and does things itself to be honest with you i mean it doesn't ask very much from central government it just gets on with things so we've got quite a vibrant um you know commissioners there vibrant chamber of commerce there you know lots of local groups um lots of volunteer groups you you were up recently doing an outside broadcast on the pier you know that there, there is a lot of um, community feeling in Ramsey which keeps it going and, and on the high street I mean ever since I, I moved over to the Isle of Man in, in uh, 2001 people have said oh what about the, the empty shops in Ramsey um, any high street has empty shops but actually what I've, I've particularly seen in the last three years is some really interesting quite quite unique new businesses opening up um, and people ca- travelling from all over the island to come up to Ramsey just to, to, to shop the, the free parking obviously helps and the commissioners um, certainly when Laurie and I were there and the commissioners now are absolutely committed to retaining that um, you know they, they come up they can go and, and shop they can eat out either for, for breakfast lunch or tea um, and it's it's just a, a really nice place to live okay got a message in from Ray who said uh, I don't see any signs of progress with a couple more development the future security of the unit uh, is everything for the residents and the staff and staffing the unit says Ray has become impossible from my sources he must have some information from the inside uh, and what is the job security so the future of come or more yeah I mean, I mean we, we, we can both talk about that both from our constituency point of view and government point of view really um, come or more is um, an, an aging building it doesn't um, live up to modern standards of residential accommodation you know they've got shared bathrooms it's difficult if, you, if you're in a wheelchair to get in, in and out but what it does have again is, is that community spirit the staff there really care they will look after people there um, through thick and
skin thin when 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 they can um, and are completely dedicated to it. And I think that that's why the people of Ramsey, um, you know, really trust Camelmore so much um, with their elderly rel- relatives. Now there were plans under the last administration to build a replacement for it. One of the the issues with the new administration coming in was to one make sure that um, that that was still valid in terms of things like the the um, the build quality and the price, which obviously lots of um, prices have gone up and we need to make sure that it's affordable, but also that it meets the needs of the, the people, not just now, but in the future. And so that's one of the reasons that um, the Treasury um, are working very closely with the Department of Health and Social Care and then Manx Care to make sure that what we build is actually future-proofed, not just for now, but in the you know going forward in terms of the um, needs of the people of Ramsey and the people of the North as well. Uh, Laurie Hooper? Yeah, so from memory, and I'm working from memory here, the plans for the new common more are still, uh, they're in the design development phase. development phase. Yeah, yeah so they're, they're at the part of the capital program which says, right, we've got a high level plan, we've got planning commission, let's go fill in the, the blanks and colour in all the bits that need colouring in, essentially. So it, it's progressing through the government's capital program at the pace that I would expect it to. Um, so there's, there's no issue there as far as I'm concerned. So my understanding is in the relatively near future, it will come back through Timwald for that kind of final mm. uh, vote, ultimately. Um, but as far as the Department of Health is concerned, it's it's progressing on track, really. As Dr. Allenson said, uh, you know, the it, it does have emotional. The current mm-hmm. Commonwealth has emotional buy-in from the population. It may be a bit frayed around the edges and may not meet all the boxes that, that need to be ticked nowadays, but people trust it. So how do you replace it with something equally trustworthy? I think a lot of the trust there comes down to the staff, actually, and the culture of the place uh, and the kind of way that they work and the very positive way they engage, not just with their residents, but with the community more broadly. That should never change. And quite frankly, those staff also deserve a better place to work. And I know there's a lot of emotional attachment to uh, to the building itself. Uh, but the reality is what we're looking at doing as a department is replacing the physical structure with a more modern physical structure uh, in terms of the staffing and that ethos and that culture. I don't see why that would change at all. And will it be on, on the same site or a site nearby? Where will it be? Uh, so the planning permission is actually for the uh, building behind it, so the old Calder Mary building, uh, which is currently owned by uh, the Ramsey Northern District Housing Committee. So in years gone by, there was an agreement in place that said, actually, we will uh, we will build our new facility on your site, and you can then have the existing Commonwealth facility to build some sheltered housing on. So essentially, it's just a swap over of those two facilities. What, what I would like to see, and I think what would work really well uh, in that area, is a, a sheltered and older person's extra care complex on the current common more site because then there's a lot of synergies between the nursing and residential care provided by the new common more set against the kind of extra care sheltered accommodation that could be provided so it could be viewed as a, a single site uh, because actually there's a lot of concern locally and I, I get this that you'd lose access to kind of the seafront views and the ability to sit out in the garden and that kind of thing but if it's a, if it's a, if it's treated for all intents and purposes as a single uh, location really for for care of, of people who are a bit older actually I think that could work really really well so that's the conversations that we need now need to start having with Ramsey Northern and District as we finish up the, the capital side with Treasury on what government wants to do with, with our bit and our money is to then start talking to the, the, the commissioners around, OK, how do we support them in then developing that site and making it something that complements uh, a new residential and nursing care home. Is it future-proof as far as numbers are concerned? So that is a really interesting question. So at the moment, what the department is looking at doing is replacing its buildings almost on a like-for-like basis. So you've seen that in Commonwealth, how you'll see that in Rayton Bay and Summerhill View. So the department is going through and saying we have a current number of, of rooms of units uh, we, we're slightly increasing that but essentially it's a like for like replacement in terms of numbers what will be published in the very near future by the housing and communities board is something called an objective assessment of housing need so that is a piece of work that says actually this is roughly how many houses we think we'll need of various types uh, based on uh, uh, what, what they've done in terms of the analysis around the census and the growing population and the aging population and all the rest of it that will give us some real hard data in terms of how many uh, houses of what type to build so do we need flats do we need bungalows do we need extra care do we need nursing care alongside that there's also a piece of work that I've asked public health to undertake which they're due to report on pretty soon that will give us more granular detail on types of housing uh, that will be needed in terms of sheltered residential nursing extra care provision so this information when taken together will actually give us uh, numbers essentially so it's something to aim for in terms of well how many 
do we need? Because at the moment, it, it's difficult to know. Actually, replacing like for like is fine, but should we be building extra of these buildings as well? Or do we have enough already? And so should we be spending our money on, on other types of, of housing? So that should hopefully all be coming together in the next couple of months. And we should be getting a, a, a real picture then of, of the shape of what housing need is on the island. Okay. Which, uh, which we can then build. Uh, and Alex Allison, it, uh, what, uh, briefly, what's the timetable for Come or More? When would you expect to see something starting to happen? Um, well, we're doing some preliminary work at the moment, just looking at the previous plans and proposals, making sure that they still meet the needs of the people of the north of the island. And, and again, we're not just replacing you know, bedrooms. One of the, the big aspects of Come or More, one of the reasons it's got so much community buy-in is it deals with respite care, it's got a day centre. You know, Lots of people use that facility, not just the people who live there, um, and call it their home. Um, so it's important to replicate those and have that access. Um, so certainly, you know, we've, we've gone through the existing plans. We just need to sense check that with the, with, the, with the department and then move forward in terms of the further design stage and then get, get it out for tender. So when we go to Timwald, we've got an up-to-date cost and we know that it can be delivered on budget and on time as well. OK, uh, let's get to the phones now. And uh, first caller on today, it's 17 minutes past. 12. Uh, I will. You're live with Alex Allenson and Laurie Hooper. Hi. Uh, this is one for this is one for Alex. Um, have you had any success, Alex, about getting permission to clean our beach yet? Yeah, well, lovely, lovely to talk. Yeah, lovely, lovely to talk to you, Will. So, if I can just explain to listeners, um, this is the 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 South Beach, and and there's a there's a lot of sort of seaweed and debris that that um, builds up there, just around about the stone pier and in front of the. Um, uh, the lifeboat station and what Wilf has been trying to do is clear that up and, 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 and get that um, sorted. One of the issues Wilf is is whether that involves taking quite a lot of the gravel away as well or whether it's just the, 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 the seaweed and so I've contacted the, the, the commissioners, they've put me in contact with DOI and DEFA and so I'm just waiting for one of the guys from highways and harbours to come back to me so we can just sort of tidy that up in, ti- in time for the summer season well, that's all right, Alex. But it's it's built it's built right up now. And the thing is, uh, if a bird starts to nest on it, then we're stuck then yeah, yeah. for at least three weeks. Yeah, and I know because you, they'll fence it off then, and then nobody can use it. Yeah, I mean, I, I know you you've got out of your way to get some you know uh, local people involved, and and they're they're going to be doing it for the commissioners and for the people of Ramsey. So I'd really like to support that as much as I can. Um, one of the issues was, was you know how much of that gravel and sand needs to be moved as well at the same time, and that that that's where it gets a little bit more complicated, I think, with with the harbours division. But certainly, I'm, I'm working with them to try to see if we can finalise this and get this done. I think uh, one of the questions is. Uh, Dr. Allenton, why is this so complicated? It's a bit of seaweed on the beach in Ramsey that used to be taken away quite frequently and quite straightforwardly. Yeah, well, the taking away the seaweed is relatively straightforward. It's just whether you want to remodel the beach and take away all the sand that, and gravel that's been built up as well. And if you do that and expose some of the substructure there, particularly the seawall and the uh, stone pier, then you could do some long-term damage to it. So that's why the Harbours Division, I think, and, and DOI have just been a little bit concerned and they want to make sure that whatever happens there um, is done you know, correctly and doesn't have any unintended consequences. But in terms of getting rid of the, the litter, again we have beach buddies up up really quite regularly. It's a clean beach but some of that seaweed does need to go, go, to go so that people can use it as a beach and really it's one of the best beaches we have in the north of the island. Wilf? Yes, but the thing is, Alex, uh, um, beach buggies have never been near that beach. Never been on it. For some reason, well, I won't go into that. But anyway, uh, the last time I got it cleaned, I got it cleaned for nothing, free, but the people want to take the gravel off because I want the gravel taken off. I never asked any permission to anybody. I just asked these people to do it, and they said, yes, we will do it for free, and they're ready to do it again for free. But uh, they want to take the gravel away. Now, they took a load of gravel away before, and that didn't compromise the, the, the wall at all yep. because it's, it's, the wall goes a lot further down than these people seem to know. I know how far it goes down because I've got pictures of it. 
but it, you can take you can take you can take uh, ten ton of uh, ten feet of gravel off there, and it wouldn't make a of a difference to the wall. Yeah, I think the wall goes a lot further down than they think it does. Yeah, I think that it's the it's the removing the gravel that I think the harbors and DIY are concerned about. So as I said, I'm trying to set up a meeting so that we can go through that properly and see what can be done, you know, as soon as possible for the summer season. Okay, all right. Uh, Wolf, we'll watch that with uh, with um, uh, interest to see what happens for that. Thanks for calling today, Wolf. We appreciate okay. that. We'll all keep right. that. Uh, we'll keep all that on the boil. Uh, and talking of the sea, um, Laurie Hooper, the flood defence scheme for the quayside, one in from Lorraine, who just said, "Whereabouts is that situation? It, it went, didn't it, to DOI? Then the commissioners didn't want what the DOI proposed. Uh, has that money gone, or is there a chance to come back with any?" So we uh, actually met with the commissioners in January uh, and talked about this. So my understanding is the uh, flood defence scheme alongside the harbour is actually being agreed right now between the commissioners and the DOI. So the DOI basically going through the right process to make sure that people who should be involved and should be supportive are involved and are supportive. And then I think they'll go through the uh, the funding process or whatever steps they need to take then to resolve that. So the last I heard was it was with the commissioners still to, to, to be whether they're supportive or not. What, what didn't they like last time? Was it losing the uh, car parking? It was a variety of issues. So I think there were concerns around the car parking. There were concerns around access to the working harbour. There were some concerns around the cost and the height of the wall. There were, there were lots of various concerns raised by the commissioners uh, to the, the previous design. I think what they really were expecting the DOI to come forward with was something a bit more basic, a bit more cost effective. And I think some of the commissioners were concerned the DOI were trying to do a kind of all, all singing, all dancing kind of uh, piece of work. So hopefully the new designs that come forward will be more aligned with what the commissioners are expecting uh, and then hopefully they'll be able to make some progress on it. Uh, Dr Allenson? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, it, it's interesting how the, how the term coastal overtopping has suddenly become part of our vocabulary but when you look at Ramsey, um, it is one of those you know, really at-risk flood areas, either from the sea coming up or from the Solby River going down and, and I think what Laurie and I have both tried to do is, is make sure that the flood defences, the, the amount of investment that's gone on right around our, our coasts also comes to protect um, the people of Ramsey and particularly the businesses on Parliament Street. Um, you're, you're quite right that previous proposals haven't been met um, with favour by the commissioners or, or the local Chamber of Commerce, in, particularly in terms of loss of parking. Um, but we do need to do something there to, to secure um, Ramsey. The other aspect of the work that was going to be done was actually um, rebuilding the highway there as well, which does need doing. It, it is a, a little bit um, uneven and also putting in the infrastructure there, particularly in terms of drainage. So if water comes in, it can drain out quite quickly. So there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done, and that needs to be done properly and in co- you know conversation with the local people. OK, thanks, Lorraine. Uh, another one in... This is Hugh now, and it's concerning Parliament Street, uh, where you've, you've broached this... Uh, say, uh, I mean, there aren't any more um, kind of empty shops proportionately than anywhere else. But uh, how do you feel about the, the makeup and the future of Parliament Street, Laurie Hooper? To be fair, I love Parliament Street, quite frankly. I think it's great. Um, I, I was never a huge fan of the uh, the regeneration that went on in terms of the road design. That's, that, that, I think, has caused us a few issues over the years. But it looks like the DOI are in the process of fixing some of those now with the speed bumps and, and whatnot. So it looks like we're seeing some progress. But in terms of the shopping, actually, the shopping street is pretty decent. You can get pretty much everything you need in town. I've never really found that to be too much of an issue. Yes, new businesses come and go. I think that's the, the nature of, of running a, a small business in a, in a quite highly competitive region environment uh, but by and large I, I find I very rarely have to travel to Douglas in order to, to get the things I need get the things I want and quite frankly an afternoon out in Ramsey is far more enjoyable than an afternoon out in the big smoke so from my perspective you know yes things could always be a bit better government really can do a bit more to help with things like regeneration support and funding but by and large I think Alex said it pretty well when he opened up Ramsey's generally just quite a nice place to be are you happy that I mean Ramsey is distinctively different to most places on the Isle of Man yeah and I think that's one of the things that really uh, attracted me to come back actually to Ramsey uh, was the fact that it is quite unique it, it isn't the same as Douglas it isn't the same as anywhere else it's got its own kind of unique feel I suppose is the way I'd, I'd describe it uh, and yeah so I can't really uh, speak highly enough of the place 
Yeah, I mean, one of the, th- I mean, Laurie, Laurie talked about the regeneration scheme, which obviously was t- to do with um, shop owners and helping them um, renovate their, their shop fronts. I think that that was really quite successful. That a large amount of money went in in terms of Parliament Street um, to, to do the roadway up, and, that, and that's had knock on benefits. The courthouse, again, is being used more and more for, pu- for public um, functions. What we do need to do, though, is, is deal with some of those vacant and derelict properties lo- along Parliament Street, which are a blight to many of our um, towns. I'm and, glad you and also that. our city. Yeah. Everybody uh, talks about it. Whose responsibility is it? Is it the commissioners, central government? Is it the owners? I, what, what, yeah, uh, I, I think the key responsibility actually is the owners. Now, some, some of them um, haven't necessarily got the money to do up their, their properties, but that's why I think they, they should look at working with governments. We had the infrastructure investment scheme um, to look at brownfield site developments, and I know that several um, companies in, in Ramsey applied for that but were unsuccessful in the first round. Round, that's fine. We've got more time to, to look at that. But but actually, some we've got some relatively wealthy um, landlords up up in Ramsey who I, I think could do more to their properties to bring them back into active use. And that's why, from a treasury perspective, after a, a Timwald uh, motion, we are looking at how we could use the rate system or actually a, a land tax system to actually work as a carrot and stick approach to bring some of these um, back into in, into use. But also, we've got to deal with some of the stumbling blocks, particularly around planning. Yeah. And in this administration, we, we, we keep on saying we need to get rid of some of the blocks in, in terms of some of the planning restrictions that apply. Parts of Ramsey are, you know, protected um, in, in terms of, of the heritage sites, in terms of the, the buildings there. So it is sometimes difficult to put up new buildings in certain areas. But there are some sites that have been, you know, left vacant for, for years that people have wanted to put money in and have been registered. So particularly the, the old Britannia pub, for instance, I know people who wanted to, to do that up. Um, there's been lots of different schemes, but it hasn't come over, come, come, come to fruition yet. I think more could be done in terms of looking at the planning, looking at the incentives, but also looking at the disincentives to get people to actually you know, put their money where their mouth is and invest in, in some of these areas in Ramsey. Okay, I, that. I think that's, that's quite an important point, actually, is from a government perspective, what the government can do is incentivise behaviours or disincentivise behaviours. So, you know, you can charge people to leave properties empty, you can provide financial support to help them do them up. Uh, but ultimately, all government can do is, is put the levers in place and start pulling them. It is on the owners of those buildings to decide then what they want to do with their buildings. So even if all these things come to fruition, even if we had the best planning system in the world and there was money on the table and, and all the rest of it, actually, if the owners of those buildings aren't minded to uh, to invest and to, to make them better to do, the, do improvements, it's hard for central government to step in and so do it. So out of sheer bloody-mindedness, they could just keep them dilapidated? Th- that, that's a possibility. I mean, it, this is where I think it gets slightly more complicated complicated because the commissioners actually have a range of powers in respect of things like dilapidated houses, for example, where the commissioners have powers to step in and do works and do works on behalf of owners and send them the bill. There's lots of options available to the authority. There's there's a process as well that exists in the UK called an empty dwelling management order, whereby the local authority actually takes over the ownership of a dilapidated house, does it up, adds it to their social housing stock, rents it out until such time as they've paid off their own costs and hands it back to the, to the owner. So there's lots of options available, I think, which some of which currently exist on the island. And in fairness, Ramsey commissioners, I think they do take a quite a proactive approach to dealing with some of the problems that they encounter, to actually using their enforcement powers quite positively. Uh, but really, it, we need to see a bit more of that going on as well, I think. Is it possible to get residential planning for the centre of Ramsey? Yes. Yes. Yes, and, and actually it's happening. The, the old Mart site is being redeveloped now by, by a private um, developer who's putting in residential accommodation there. So, so it is happening. And that, that was a brownfield site that was left vacant for, for ages. I mean, the other success, but, but it actually it, 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 it's probably the worst example of dilapidated houses on the Isle of Man, was Bleak House. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, that, that was a disagreement between some of the, the, the freeholders and, and led, led it to literally go to rack and ruin. The commissioners stepped in in, put a new roof on it because the water was flowing through to the adjacent property. It is now being done up, but that's taken a long time um, to actually get that over over the the the, thre- the threshold because of issues with with disagreements between the owners. Um, and, and again, that that it, it's how much government, either local or, or central government, wants to step into some of these um, issues in terms of compulsory purchase. We don't tend to do that on the Isle of Man um, because it's seen as a bit draconian and, and the last measure that you want to do. But actually, I think in some cases it's the right thing to do. Okay, uh, and Rich has just dropped a note in and just said, well, briefly he'll say, how hard is it to ask somebody to paint their house or to pick up their rubbish, Laurie Hooper? And I think that 
that's the point. You can ask people to do these things, but then actually, if they say no, it's very difficult then to, to enforce that on them. Uh, so the, you know, ultimately, everyone has a right to own their own private property and manage that in a way that they see fit, provided, of course, they're not acting in detriment to, to everyone else that lives around them. And that's where a lot of the local authority enforcement powers come in. So in terms of dilapidated properties or properties, I think the language in the law is detrimental to the amenity of the area. So it's quite a broad brush stroke. Uh, but then it comes down to what's reasonable. Is it reasonable for the commissioners to kick the front door down with a paintbrush and do your... It's not, actually. It's so actually, there's a, there's a wide range of things they can and do often do. Uh, but I think what some of us, I think like Alex was just saying, would like to see is a bit more of that proactive interventionist approach, being willing to do some of the things uh, that, that, that we, I think, government and local and national have the powers to do, whereas quite often people will, will take a lot more care around that and probably might not be as willing as, as say, I would like them to be to take that enforcement action where it's appropriate. Yeah, but so, I mean, some of these cases are quite complicated. I've been involved with cases whereby somebody's been put into hospital for a long period of time or ends up going to nursing home and there's nobody to look after their house so leaks start appearing and, and it, it gets the, gar- the gardens get run down and then it's quite difficult for the commissioners to, to step in and start cleaning somebody's garden or people who, you know, unfortunately pass away and it's it's a real um, issue trying to chase um, who, who their heirs are and sometimes they're, they're overseas as well and trying to make them responsible. I mean, as I said, there is work going forward in terms of looking at, at those properties that are zero rated because they're uninhabitable or derelict and trying to say, well, hang on a minute, that, that's only for a certain length of time. It's up to the, you as the owner, your responsibility to either repair that house or, the, or, the, or, that, or that shop and put it back into active use, or we're going to charge you rates for it. You know, we, we, We've got to actually look at how we can incentivise people to do the right thing. OK, we're live with the Ramsey MHKs today, Laurie Hooper and Alex Allenson, and we're on till one today. Text, email, call and WhatsApp. Everyone's more conscious of energy usage nowadays. So Manx Utilities has begun installing smart meters for standard domestic customers island-wide. With our Smart Living app available too, you'll be in control of tracking and managing your energy. No need to contact us. We'll be in touch when we're ready to fit your smart meter. Visit the Smarter Living page at manxutilities.in. Manx Utilities, delivering a smarter future. Construction waste today. Tells recycle for another day. A builder skip or two. Tell skip will bring to you. At Tell Skip Hire and Waste Disposal in Snugborough, you only pay for the waste you bring. For waste disposal and skips, give us a call on 677-137. That's 677-137. Visit Tells today or find Tells Limited on Facebook. Call Tells Skips today. 677-137. Staying younger looking, it's our primary objective. The holy grail of skin aesthetics. But it's not any one product, it's a state of mind. At the Tracy Bell Clinic, it's our passion and desire to innovate, to reinvent, recreate, reimagine everything over and over again. Are you ready for a change? Try our exclusive Alma Laser Skin Treatment. The results are remarkable. Call the Tracy Bell Clinic on 613 323 for a consultation. Are you concerned about your eye health? Holmes and Davidson Opticians in Douglas are proud to offer the Idon Ultra Wide Field Retinal Imaging and Heidelberg 4D OCT systems, state of the art machines that allow early detection and management of eye diseases. Don't wait. Book your appointment today and ensure the health of your eyes with the best technology available. Call 676 230 or visit homesanddavidsonopticians.co.uk now. I'm Amy Griffiths and on this week's Island Life, we're talking about housing. During the 2021 election campaign, it was one of the most important topics for people on the doorstep. But with rental shortages, high average house prices and limited support for first-time buyers still issues on the island, is it still a priority for this administration? Find out tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock or available as a podcast at maxradio.com. The Man in Line with Andy Wint. And Laurie Hooper and Alex Allenson are in today. MHKs from Ramsey and Stephen. Good afternoon. You're live with the Ramsey MHKs. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Ramsey MHKs, and good afternoon, listeners. I was just listening to both of your comments and speaking about dilapidated and uh, vacant properties, and I heard you both speak about uh, giving plenty of stick 
to the owners, but there's several aspects to this that I would like you to consider. And that is that a number of years ago, there was a, a very well-appointed grant system of help to single property owners uh, to enable them to complete big works that could be repairs to the roof, uh, electrical, structural repairs, and there was a good grant system. Now, I believe that was uh, withdrawn a number of years ago. And uh, there is has been initiatives, so I know, that you've uh, the Department for Enterprise, for example, has been giving substantial numbers of sums for big property development, new development in the main, and you've got the uh, MDC, which is getting in sums of money. But uh, you, it would appear that uh, the 5,000-odd empty properties around the island, that you either have ignored them or felt it's unable for you to help these uh, bring these properties back into use. There will be a number of reasons why they're empty. It could be that the owners have d- died and we don't know who they are, or the owners simply do not have the money to uh, to to uh, improve them. You look often look at the property and think, is it empty? And you find somebody is living there. So you're giving plenty of stick. You're helping the new developments, but you don't seem to be helping the individual property owners who have older property stock. And as you may both be aware, it's very difficult to get mortgages for older property stock unless they fully comply with all the building survey regulations, the wiring, the plumbing, the structure, the timber. And I do feel it's something that, as you have given money out to big developers, I just want to know why you've ignored this section of society. It seems a very unfair way to do it. So there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, the 5,000 property number you just quoted, that that I think is roughly the number of empty properties at a particular point in time, so on the census date, essentially. Um, But most of those aren't dilapidated. There's a huge difference between a property being empty and being uninhabitable or dilapidated. Uh, The actual numbers of dilapidated properties on the island will be far, far smaller than that. Uh, But ultimately, if someone owns a property that's dilapidated and they don't live in it and they can't afford to do it up, why don't they just sell it? Um, it, It definitely is possible to get mortgages on properties that are quite old and not up to code. I mean, the house I bought was old and not up to code. Um, that's that's the nature of, of buying a property that's been around for 50 or, or 100 years. That's not uncommon, actually. Uh, so my question, I suppose, is all the, all the other schemes you've talked about, the additional grants for energy efficiency, for example, that have come in under this government, the money for Max Development Corporation to build 133 extra properties, the money that's gone to the island inf- infrastructure scheme to build another chunk of properties. It's all about building new properties where otherwise there wouldn't be a property. Uh, if we were in a situation where there were people out there trying to sell their dilapidated property and they couldn't sell them, I think I'd have a lot of sympathy for the argument that you're making. But the reality is, in most of these cases, it's people that own one of these dilapidated properties that don't want to sell it. Uh, they want someone else to give them money to do it up so they can then make more money out of it, ultimately. And, and that's not a position that I necessarily agree with. So I think if someone wants to uh, to sell a property that they can't afford to do up, I think that is perfectly reasonable. Uh, and I think if there were issues out there in terms of people getting mortgages to buy those properties again I think that would be an issue we'd need to look at but at the moment uh, as we've seen with kind of the built heritage report that's coming to Timwald uh, shortly this kind of call for property owners who own a second property but they can't afford to do it up they want the taxpayer to stump up some cash I don't really think that's a reasonable position to be in yeah it's interesting so I can remember going um, canvassing in 2016 and meeting a lot of people who lived in big older properties who wanted to downsize but the property market at the time meant that they just couldn't sell i think that's changed now people are looking at buying older properties and doing them up um you you stephen's quite right that there was a an existing scheme that i think stopped by eddie tier um over over a decade ago which looked to give people grants to, to do up their houses and um, what we now have, have done is replaced that with the green living grant scheme which concentrates on energy efficiency um 
of of existing houses gives you know up to five thousand pounds to help people put things like double glazing you know insulation in to improve their their housing um, and and actually going forward there are a lot of other other schemes from the private sector to help people do up their houses but but we do live in, on an island where some people are asset rich and cash poor and I think it's difficult to, to deal with that I've um, looked at various uh, options such as equity release schemes and things like that so that people can do up their houses it, it's quite complicated though and I think you know if somebody lives in in, in, a, in a house that's no longer suitable for them that then as Laurie has said one of the one of the options is is to sell up to perhaps you know a young family who can do that house up um, and make it a home again and they can downsize and, and I think we need to have that flexibility in terms of the housing market by increasing the overall range of housing we have on the island. Stephen? Well I think Mr Hooper completely missed the point whether deliberately or by accident, uh, uh, Mr. Allenson, you've you've identified there is a problem, but you haven't really come up with uh, a solution. An, an easy solution would be to reverse, uh, if it was Mr. Tia, Mr. Tia's decision to uh, stop the grant system. So I do think you're missing a trick uh, by not having the grant aid system to help people. I do believe that was a a good way to incentivise. Uh, uh, people, I don't know where Mr. Mr. Hooper's figures come from that banks will give money for older property because a lot of people I speak to say it's impossible to. Uh, to so we're both speaking with different uh, opinions. Okay, Laurie Hooper. Uh, yeah, so like I say, I think I'm talking about people that have a, a second property that they can't afford to do up. I think it's a slightly different kettle of fish if you're living in a property that is unfit. Uh, but ultimately, again, right now at least, you can find a pretty good uh, market for selling those properties and moving into somewhere that is more suitable for you. In terms of comments around mortgages, I mean, we, the, this question comes up quite a bit actually and there have been regular and frequent Timwood questions around this and the DFE regularly go away and check with what's going on out there in the market and they come back and the answer is the same every single time uh, which is actually the mortgages are, are much more readily available now there was definitely an issue a number of years ago uh, when banks sort of re- sort of removed their kind of five percent uh, mortgages these days actually it's all getting pretty much back to where it was pre-crash in that actually the mortgage market again is pretty lively uh, obviously you've got to be careful with the rates because they're changing uh, almost on a week by week basis it feels sometimes but the reality is if people are out there and they have a, a second property that is uh, dilapidated you know the, they really need to look at all the things that they can do all the options that are open to them and one of those options is looking to sell it to someone else who, who can afford to do it up I think the default here asking for government grants uh, is symptomatic I think of a bit of an issue we have on the island which is people want government to be smaller and to spend less taxpayers money on things but ultimately every time there's an issue uh, we do get these calls for government needs to step in and spend taxpayers money to solve the problem and, and sometimes that's the right thing to do and sometimes it, it isn't okay Stephen, was that an answer to your question not really it, 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 it avoided the the central issue which is government Despite what Mr. Hooper says, government do give money to developers for new buildings and flats and apartments, and they do not give money for even, a, say, a single a single purchaser that wants to buy a house, but possibly the the ability to uh, renovate it it puts them off because there's no help with the grant system. And is this you're talking uh, about particularly people with just one property or people with more than one property? Yeah, Mr. Hooper's concentrating on people with more than property. I'm talking about a person who may wish to purchase one property, but it needs a certain amount of work done and it is impossible to uh, to find the funding. Now, if the grant system was reintroduced, then there's there to know that uh, that the government can help. Uh, I believe it used to be that there's a set amount given a number of number of applicants in the year would be would become on a first come first served basis, and that would once it was gone up, but then it would have to wait till the next year. Uh, so it would appear that uh, new builds are good, and uh, trying to bring some of the older properties back to use is not so good. Okay, all right, we appreciate that, Stephen. Thanks for your call uh, today with the Ramsey MH case, Doctor Allenson and Mr. Hooper and uh, Alex Allenson. You were saying you once saw a file with how many how many uh, bits about the marina on it? How many chapters <laughs> were there? Uh, it was it was when I was a, a Ramsey commissioner, and and one of the my my predecessors gave me a huge great file about all the various schemes that been proposed for, for Ramsey um, but none had really progressed and, So and can, can you tell me where, 
where are we with the proposed marina? Um, well, the, 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 the last proposal that came, came forward was a private proposal in terms of making it um, on the South Beach, um, going all the way up almost to, to the pier. Um, that's we're, we're, you know, um, there, there was lots of talk, and we're, we're going back now about four or five years. Um, lots of talk about that. Lots of public meetings. Some people were very in favour, um, particularly th- those people who use the harbour. Um, some people were very against, in, in that they saw it um, very, very much as losing their beach. And we're, uh, as Wilfer said, it, um, the South South Beach is very well used, and one of the nicest beaches that we have um, in the north of the island. Um, as far as I know, that 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 scheme hasn't progressed, partly because of a lack of. Fun- Funding, um, because it was a private scheme, there was you quite made quite obvious at the time that there was no government money um, going to be put into it. Um, but partly because of the environmental in- impact of it as well, um, both in terms of the the beach, but also what lies under the water, particularly eel grass. And we now, uh, I think, are a lot more aware of our maritime environment. That whole area is a is a protected area. So doing large scale development on it would probably be against most of the restrictions we have. So I. I think the, you know that that scheme has been and gone. Um, I don't think anyone's call, you know called the day on it in terms of the particular individual who was um, promoting it to begin with. But from my point of view, that there, there is no active um, marina scheme for for the, for the north going forward at the moment. Okay, before we go to Laurie, just uh, I'll just read you an email found in from Martin regarding this. I listened to the manifesto broadcast of uh, candidates seeking election uh, a, a few weeks ago. This is the one that goes back to 2021. Well, now, most commented on the need for economic growth to preserve the shopping area, standards expected in Ramsey, yet almost in the same breath, some of the people seem to be against the development of a 24-access marina in Ramsey. The Isle of Man has limited time access marinas in Douglas and Peel and limited anchorage, anchorages elsewhere. Hence, a few cruising yachtsmen contemplate the Isle of Man as a location to sail to or even to include in their passage plans. Here is an enormous opportunity to put Ramsey on the map provide a stimulus to economic growth and provide jobs related to our maritime heritage. So why are we so resistant to change and reject such opportunities that land in our lap, says Martin? Uh, Laurie Hooper, uh, would you like to see Ramsey with a marina? I think I could challenge much of what was in that correspondence, actually. So in in short, I think there is... uh there would be benefits from having a, a kind of marina in Ramsey. My view is it would be much better served inside the harbour area to support a harbour regeneration. Uh, but actually, the the location of the last uh, proposal on being on the the South Beach was very much a non-starter. I think. I mean, they made the arguments around economic growth and all the the jobs it would create. But the reality is, if you build a marina with lots of shopping facilities there, how many of those people that visit the island are going to walk down Parliament Street? And the answer is probably not a lot. Uh, so what you'd be essentially doing is is drawing business out of Parliament Street onto the, the seafront basically to where the new development was. So I, I was never convinced that actually the, the job creation and the economic activity they were talking about would be anything other than displacement. It would displace activity that already goes on and just move it somewhere else which would be to the detriment I think of Parliament of Ramsey and Parliament Street, Ramsey and actually all the local businesses we already have. So it, it, again from my perspective it was a private development. I think it was a, a non-starter for various reasons a lot of which Alex has already talked about. Uh, I don't think it really was going to go anywhere. Uh, with the location that it was, especially in the light of the significant public opposition from the people in Ramsey. Uh, so, in short, I think a marina in the north would probably be beneficial. I think the one that was previously proposed to be built on the South Beach was very much uh, not going to be the right thing for Ramsey. OK, uh, back with a final word with the Ramsey MHKs in a moment. Just a quick word. After it being our 60th anniversary after Man in Line Monday and Friday, we look back in the archive and uh, after Man in Line today, uh, John Moss uh, looks back to the clear Clean Sweep litter campaign in the late 1980s, launched on the Isle of Man by Nigel Mansell, the Clean Sweep litter campaign. You'll also hear former racing driver and island resident talking to Jeff Cannell. The only radio station that's Manx, and we're proud of it. Celebrating 60 years... This is Manx Radio. Life isn't always easy, and we can sometimes feel we're totally alone in our struggles. From employment issues, housing benefit complications and relationship breakdowns, to faulty goods and bad workmanship. But whatever hurdles you face, Manx Citizens Advice Service at Thai Russian Port Erin is here to help you overcome them with free confidential support and advice and guidance on where to get the help you need. We're open each Friday from 10.30am to 12.30pm, no appointment necessary. We'll 
Alternatively, leave a message on 833-969 or email scac at manx.net and one of our team will get back to you. Citizensadvice.im. Here for you for life. When couples decide to part, there's a lot to deal with. There's the matter of the children, the matter of your property, the matter of pensions. You need to consider the matter of existing wills and perhaps the matter of a business. And because you matter, Man Benham Advocates are here for you when it comes to divorce and family matters. For help and advice and a free initial consultation, call Man Benham on 639 350. Man Benham, here for you. See what's in store now at Ramsey Garden Centre. We've spring and summer bulbs and seeds and plants for tubs and borders. Plus onion and garlic sets, seed potatoes, spring planters and more, including azaleas, rhododendrons and roses, fruit trees, primroses and violas. There's something for gardeners young and old at Ramsey Garden Centre. And for exclusive offers, pick up a reward card today. Check on Facebook or call into Ramsey Garden Centre. Open seven days a week on Albert Road. The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Laurie Hooper's here and also uh, Dr. Allenson, Alex Allenson as well. Uh, what would you say to constituents in Ramsey at the moment? Should they be optimistic or wary of the future? Yeah, I, I think people generally in Ramsey are optimistic anyway, whatever I say to them. Um, I think we, we live in a lovely, beautiful town and there's a real commitment there by everyone in the town, everyone who runs businesses there, who lives there, but also the local um, authority and the MHKs, both Laurie and myself, to, to keep Ramsey going and keep Ramsey alive. But but again, Ramsey does it by itself. And, and I think there is that community spirit and independence, which has always been there and hopefully always will be there. Okay. Uh, you uh, do quite, uh, well, monthly surgeries, Laurie Hooper. Does anything particular come through from the constituents? Yeah, it's, it's a range of issues, actually. Me and Alex uh, always up there, second Saturday of every month, 10 till 12 in the corridor's office at the town hall. Uh, no appointments, just, just drop in. Um, but no, it's a range of things. So sometimes it's people with, with personal issues, whether it's benefits, housing, whatever it may be. Uh, we get people that want to come in and talk about the budget, taxes, you know, big picture national stuff. The health service, unsurprisingly, comes up quite a bit, especially access to GP appointments and things like that. But broadly speaking, it's the range of issues that you'd expect to get on a day-to-day basis, I think, uh, dealing with the issues that we kind of deal with. There's nothing that comes through as a single overriding area of, of concern. How do you deal with personal issues, uh, Laurie Hooper? I mean, if somebody comes with a, with, an, with a very personal problem, family problem, perhaps health problem, how does a, an elected representative, what, at what point do you jump in? Uh, we deal with it very confidentially, I would say. Uh, so everything has to be about, well, what does that individual want us to, to achieve? Are they looking to get an appointment? Are they looking to have a benefit reviewed? Whatever it may be, actually, what is it they need us to do? And then it's making sure that they're fully aware of what they're sharing with us, who we're going to be sharing that with uh, the steps we're going to take to try and help them uh, move things along I mean not everything is within our gifts as MHKs we're not individual decision makers in that context so we can't tell government to do things but what we can do is uh, help people navigate the system so that they get the outcome that is the right outcome for them as as far as possible Uh, but everything is dealt with very much in a a confidential on a very personal basis Uh, And final word from uh, from, uh, Alex Allenson for the future of Ramsey Yeah I I mean what I'd say to your listeners is, is if you haven't been up to Ramsey recently go and visit um it, it's it's changed it continues to change it will always carry on changing but it's a on really good place to come up and visit you know to come up see the shops go around the morag park have a game of bowling um you know have lunch or maybe have dinner there or go out go out for the evening there it's a great place to live and work and i'd like to welcome anyone you know to come up and just see what the local people can do for themselves okay good to have you along laurie hooper alex allison thanks for being with us thank you very much, much. So stick around for Nigel Mansell and Jeff Cannell after Man in Line. Remember, on Wednesday, big day today. Well, big day on Wednesday because, A, we're live at St Ninian's High School with the students. Tomorrow's voters today. And also, of course, we're live out and about because the Queen's coming to Douglas to, uh, to make it a city. In the meantime, if you want to get in touch... Email maninline at manxradio.com. The answer phone's also on on 682631. And stick around after the news. Christie's here with one to three. Thanks to Ben Hartley on the phones today. Enjoy the rest of your Monday. W-I-N-T is serving you as the nation station. This is Manx Radio.
When the idea of beach buddies was first mooted in 2006, founder Bill Dale may not have envisaged how much of a treasured Manx institution it would become. Over the years, attempts have been made to clean up after those who frankly don't give a monkey's way they're through there. You get the picture. When British Formula One legend Nigel Mansell lived here, he got very involved in his island home. He was a special constable. He also helped launch the Clean Sweep campaign. Now then... Here's a voice you may recognise. Well, we're up at the TD grandstand where the sensational news that Nigel Mansell appears to be not signing for Ferrari for next year, but in fact is transferred to Leyland Scarab and is at the controls now and, of course, is having the complicated layout of these very, very rapid machines explained to him. And uh, there are worries, in fact, that he may not be able to cope with the power that these are going to be laying down when he takes the controls down the TD pit lane. But with number 27 on board, all is set for this takeoff. Not a semi automatic gearbox as on the Ferrari. A co driver on his knee, son Leo. And Nigel takes the wheel. Leslie Nickel just getting the story for the Express. These sort of jobs are very difficult to bring off, really, because no one quite knows the procedure. But listen now as we start up. With the turbo charging well. And we're ready for takeoff now, slipping the box into first gear and waiting for the green lights. We're on the red now, Councillor Kenish has the flag. And right in front of him is Nigel's Ferrari road car. I hope he doesn't drive right over the top of that. Well, then there will be a row. Smoothly into one of the gears, anyway. The levers are not on the wheel as in the Ferrari. It's a good laugh, this, but it's a serious campaign, isn't it? And you're keen to lend your name to it. Yes, it's very serious, and I'm only too pleased to help out because, uh, I mean, the campaign to keep the environment clean and to keep our island clean. And as everybody knows, uh, the island is our home, and uh, I feel very proud to be part of uh, the Isle of Man, and uh, anything I can do to help, um, I feel, is uh, obviously very good. Hard to fit these sort of things into a busy racing schedule, though. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I literally leave here now and uh, within the next hour I fly off the island and uh, get ready for uh, the Monza race, which is probably the most important one for for the whole year. But still, when you come to the island, you get away from it all, as indeed in the original days. Yes, I mean, the island, as everybody knows, is very, very special and uh, they only have to travel a little bit like I do and uh, they find out how special the island is. Part of island life for 60 years. This is your Manx Radio.